us started. Yes. Uh, today is what Monday, November seventh. We're on the eve of election before Doomsday. Uh, this is the uh, midterm uh, review for uh, midterm two for ECE uh, thirty thirty here at Ohio State. And um, let me pull up your examination. Will uh, will follow. These two, let me get the cursor out of the way. These two PDFs, that's where the material will emanate from. This is for, uh, the old legacy 432 uh, quarter system, segment two, all about PN junctions, metal semiconductor junctions, hetero junctions. And then, as, you, as I've articulated before, I like to do a circular curriculum. And then we're going to go into ECE 432 segment three diode applications. So then you see, we walk them around the block and you see how they perform, and then you really start to appreciate the internal device physics, okay? That's all that's on the midterm. Everything else is kind of fluff. The uh, National Renewable Energy Lab efficiency chart, that's just for eye candy for you. Uh, the NDR chapter, the book chapter that I wrote uh, with my uh, former students, that's a bit eye candy also. Uh, I had some of that in the diode applications. And uh, obviously, we're down here in the FETs right now. That's not testable. That'll appear on your final. And this review here is the what well, was the legacy of what I was trying to teach 432, um, uh, trying to teach 30, 331 to the 432 students. Those that those students that didn't have me uh, as the prereq. Uh, I wanted to make sure there was no disconnect because you see how I lay down all these foundational uh, elements and materials, and so therefore I wanted to make sure everyone was up to speed. So that's kind of basically, for you, that's a duplication of what midterm one was. So it's just those two PDFs. So that's all I'm going to drill through. I'm going to follow the same format as before. I'm going to just kind of rifle through those two PDFs. I'm going to uh, try to highlight the hot topics that I think are important, and then I'll open up for question and answer. You can interrupt me and, and ask questions as we go as well. That's not going to offend me. Um, and the rule of thumb is there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, sometimes. Ben? So uh, we, we have to, uh, uh, so everything is on the table here. So even this first part is, uh, is repetitious because I, I drilled through the semiconductor processing techniques. So we don't need to go revisit that, but recognize if you were to pare things down, I do want to point out that silicon processing tends to be an additive process. Um, that you start off with a silicon wafer, and we, now you've seen you do a diffusion. You do a, uh, 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 an ion implantation. You do an oxidation. You do all these things that are additive. That was traditional silicon processing. And the 3.5 materials tends to be you epitaxially grow this sophisticated structure, and then you sculpt it away through patterning, etching, metallization, and it's like you're making, it's like you're revealing the Michelangelo, uh, uh, you know, it's like you're revealing the David uh, from the marble, uh, you know, if you're Michelangelo. So, so that's kind of the difference, but this is not testable. So those P injunction epitaxy, diffusion, breeze through that right now. This is all repetitious of what your midterm one was. It will come back to haunt you potentially on the final, because the final is holistic, is comprehensive. Be weighted towards field effect transistors, but it's, uh, 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 but it, it's, uh, it could, could potentially be there. Okay, so now here's where you start. We had, in the completion of the midterm one material, um, we have the concept of what a PN junction is. You know, I give you this analogy. It's like think of it as a parking garage where maybe we're trying, you know, we're trying to park cars. Maybe the middle middle decks are forbidden. That's a forbidden energy gap, and so we're parking cars up in the seventh floor and down on the first floor. And there's some floors in between that are forbidden, and the semiconductor. We're trying to move the cars around. We're trying to have basically a go-kart race up on the seventh floor. And that is, that's moving the, the charge around, moving the electrons around, right, through drift or diffusion. So 
what happens when you take this one semiconductor that's p-type that has all the cars parked on the first floor, essentially, and marry it up to a, a, an n-type material where all those cars parked up on the seventh floor, right? That's where the story begins, and that's the most important part, perhaps. And that's why I do very important here. Um, so... You know, the whole concept starts off with, uh, does this show up on the, yeah, okay. So we're going to start off with that, uh, you know, the, the one equation I had you commit to memory, n times p equals ni squared, and then you start off with, okay, so I've got, um, I've got, uh, let's call this mn, and then therefore that's pn, and this is p sub p, and this is uh, n sub p. So therefore, this is going to be my donor density. We're going to assume a one-to-one -one ratio, right? And we're going to assume this is my acceptor ratio, one-to-one. -one. We're going to assume full ionization. Everything's well-behaved. Ben? Scroll down, sir. Scroll it's down. on this page. Oh, okay. I like to draw. You know I like to draw. I know. And We're running out of time. Okay. <laughs> Point well taken. Okay. So, so here you have this discontinuity, and so therefore you open up the floodgates, and what happens? The degree of freedom. Well, the holes are going to come diffusing across, because diffusion is driven by a concentration gradient. And here we have a huge no, uh, uh, charge imbalance, um, uh, a concentration gradient imbalance. And so... And this is supposed to be on a semi-log, which if I had been letting me draw, draw this, I would have shown the log scale. Um, and so that's missing here. So, uh, but that, what the books fail to emphasize very strongly, and I will emphasize on the midterm, is you don't get free charge for nothing. There's a consequence. You have ionized donors, you have ionized acceptors being left behind, right? So I'm building up this electric field, this charge, this dipole in the middle of the depletion region. And that becomes the depletion region. So uh, there's usually some form of this on every midterm because this is so important. So as the carriers are diffusing across the junction, triggered by the, the uh, um, concentration gradient, it produces this charge imbalance by the ionized centers. These ionized centers create this electric field, dipole, and the electric field opposes the diffusion of carriers because right, that's the bending the bands to the Poisson equation. And eventually the diffusion and electric field reach equal equilibrium and the resulting charge region is called the depletion region. Right? So that's really key, that, that it's triggered by the concentration gradient, which leads to the ionized centers, which leads to the electric field. And electric field, so it's basically drift and diffusion are balancing. So it's a dynamic equilibrium. So if, you, if I ask you about dynamic on the, on the second midterm, some people uh, were, were puzzled by what I meant by dynamic. This is a dynamic equilibrium. It means that drift and diffusion are actually not zero, but because they're going oppositely, they cancel each other. So the net is zero, so the, so the current is zero. The measured current outside is zero. Yeah, so these balance each other, drift and diffusion. The net is zero, but they're both actually uh, uh, balancing each other. So here's your uh, uh, concentration gradient here, 10 to the 16 versus 10 to the, 10 to the 5. Yeah, so 11 orders of magnitude driving, the, driving, driving that. Yes? So if, if it's a dynamic equilibrium, what resets it to like the initial conditions to keep like the carriers, the charge carriers flowing? Um, so some of these are, uh, I guess for the, for the video I should stay on this side of it. So, so if these are lost to drift, they're going to be replaced by generation. There's always thermal generation. In fact, thermal generation happens here, 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 here. Thermal generation is happening throughout the diode. Right? That's independent of position. That's, that's just driven by 
what is KT, and there's a statistically random opportunity that some charge in the valence band can be popped up to the conduction band. So this is always being replaced by generation recombination statistics. The, even in the depletion region? Even in the depletion region. That's your, that's your reverse saturation current. Remember, it's the generation in or near the depletion region. Right? And these guys, if they, if they disappear, uh, and some of them are pulled away, these are the majority carriers, and they're also going to be replaced by generation recombination. Generation recombination will always restore something that's been perturbed back to its equilibrium point, right? I've said this before. It's like, it's like, um, uh, I don't know. The one, the one example I had is that you, you get a uh, flu shot and you have the flu serum concentrated right where the, the needle went in. But, but over time, generation recombination, you know, it's kind of like recombination is kind of like the absorption of the body. Eventually, that's going to bring that down to, to some stable level. So anytime you perturb and put too much in one place, Mother Nature is going to want to spread it back out and restore it back. And so we see that in the switching diodes, too, when we get to that. You'll see how the tail of the, uh, of the minority carrier charge is, is flipping up and down based on the uh, statistics. Um, Okay, so uh, so once you create that charge imbalance, you create the ionized centers, which leads to rho, right? I've got this charge density rho, and so I'm going to have this dipole. Once I have a dipole um, uh, uh, staring at each other, I'm going to have an electric field. And so this electric field will peak at the metallurgical junction, because that's where all the field lines are penetrating across, right? Like the field lines are going to start on the negative charge and terminate on a positive charge, and so they're, they're going backwards here. And so the maximum number of field lines are <coughs> piercing the metallurgical junction, and they're linearly dropping off as you go further, because the integral of a constant is going to be a, a, a linear uh, variation, and then what the what um, Streetman does not show, but um, but uh, where is it? What modular series shows is that then you take the second integral and the triangle. Forget about this perturbation. They're trying to show you some higher order effects that are not important to us right now. This should be a triangle, and then you integrate the triangle, and something that's linearly varying goes to a parabolic. And so then you map that on to the, to the band diagram. Um, and, uh, and then you end up with this. And so remember that the carriers there are really more like that sail. If you go back to your Fermi Dirac statistics, it's going to be more that the carriers are assembled more like that. So as that is revealed, as this lobe, as this uh, highest concentration of, minor, of, of majority carriers is revealed as the bands bend with an applied bulk voltage, you're going to get um, uh, the forward diffusion. And so carriers will move. Once they're inside the depletion region, there's an electric field, and the electric field is going to drive that, drive them down. Holes will come up, of course. And uh, so then you end up with the, you've got hole diffusion, we've got hole drift, we've got electron diffusion, we've got electron drift, we've got four different current components we've got to worry about and sort of do bookkeeping for. But what's the rate limiting step for the drift? This is a good example question. Electron volt pair generation. Yes. Yes. Concentration. The minor. Yes. The, the, we're both saying the same thing essentially. It's the it's the generation that's happening in or near the depletion region, right? In or near. In or near. So, it's it's these guys, right? So this is near. This is within within one diffusion length. 
These guys are lemmings. They have the 50-50 chance to go on left to right. So 50% of those may end up going across. But if I had a uh, generation um, event in the depletion region, that electric field is going to sweep that right out. And now you know that's probably how I'm going to make my photo detector, right? I'm going to want to, to do that. So, so that's going to be, so if I have a thermal generation or maybe a photo stimulated event, uh, that's going to be swept out. So it's in or near, and not shown here are the little holes, minority carrier holes that are down there within the diffusion length, uh, hole diffusion length in the valence band. Yes. So if yeah. the thermal generation doesn't happen in or near the depletion region, then it becomes a component of the diffusion? No. Uh, generation is, is invariant to where it is. Generation is happening everywhere. Right. So the only one, but the only ones that that count are the ones that circumnavigate the junction. So what if one, so one electron's uh, like excited left of the depletion region? Yeah, here. But then will it, yeah, will it want to diffuse over to the p-type? Uh, yeah, actually, to be, to be, you're exactly, Aaron, you're exactly right. It's actually, this is, is a diffusion event, and it has a 50-50 chance of diffusing, because diffusion is going to go, you know, left and right. And so this, that's why I'm saying this has a 50-50 chance. Once it goes across the po po point of no return, then the electric field is going to sweep it across. Yeah. Um, that's the internal electric field? Are we under a Yeah, the, built, the, yeah. Built, the, the electric field, uh, which will be modulated by the external bias if, you, if you're, but this is uh, a zero biased. Okay, so. So then you end up with the diode. And essentially, why this is going up exponentially is you're just revealing this exponential carrier density. And in here, the, this is called, this is appropriately called the generation. This is the reverse saturation current, which is the generation that happens in or near the depletion region. So uh, you can go through Gauss's law. Uh, and calculate from the, using the Poisson equation. So you just count up the charge, and you come up with the electric field, and um, and you integrate again. So uh, you get the electric field, you integrate again, and the electric field goes to the potential. So here's in the derivative form, here's in the integral form, and you end up with what the contact potential is, which is basically just one half base times height. It's basically a triangle, one half base times height, and so that ends up being v naught, <laughs> and uh, a function of the, of the dopings and the permittivity of the semiconductors and the depletion width, and so then depletion width is a function of the two, two side two dopings on either side, and the contact potential, and if we rewrite it independent of the contact potential, these are probably more usable forms of the equations. Again, no equations. This is concepts. This is the device physics, right? So you don't have to do this. Um, uh, so here you can see this is maybe the candidate of a, of a one-sided junction. If I have one-sided junction and uh, the donors are doped very heavily, 10 to the 18, and the acceptors are doped very lightly at 10 to the 15, where does the depletion region go? It pushes into the lightly doped. So here's, here's the Ed A. And so this ends up being near unity, and so then it ends up showing that, uh, uh, sorry, this ends up being dominated by the ND down here, which is very large. So that makes this very small, so it depletes very minimally into the depletion region. And here it extends very uh, far into the, uh, because this ND and ND becomes, uh, the ratio becomes near unity. So here you can see some, uh, some, some examples, but I've left that up to homework. Uh, for you. Uh, and so then here you end up, you can calculate the quasi Fermi level difference on the one side and the other side, and then you add it together and you get the total contact potential. Okay. Know how to draw a band diagram. Right? I always, whenever you see me draw a band diagram, I start from the, I always assume, say, Fermi level is flat, is, is flat, and then I start from the two extrema. 
I then, once I add my Fermi level, I then put where's my conduction band and valence band respective to the Fermi level. Is it highly doped or, or m m lightly doped? You know, that'll depend how much I'm going to skew it from the Fermi level. And then I do the same over here, and then I draw in my, uh, my band bending in between. And I should result in, in, a, in a band diagram. Uh, okay, so here you can see uh, to uh, degeneracy, if we, if we dope it so heavily that the uh, Fermi level comes within 3 kT, we call that a degenerately doped, so that's where you would start to call it N plus, P plus, kind of heavily doped. Um, and so, yeah, here's, a, here's an example of a one-sided junction. So... Uh, five to the uh, five times ten to the fifteen was weaker, so the depletion region pushes farther into that. This is this side is ten to the eighteen, so it's got more leverage. Yes, Cody. And uh, it does this to balance the charges essentially, right? So yes, goes, I mean this is a broken line, but the area under this rectangle has to equal the area under that. Charge neutrality. Charge neutrality. Yeah, I charge balance. It's a dipole. It's a dipole. Yeah. And. Um, so we end up, uh, though the electric field is one-sided. Now you saw the utility of this when we got into avalanche photodiodes and so forth, where we could put the, put the field on one side of the junction where we could, we could control where the avalanching occurred. Right? So that has some utility. Um, yeah, so here's an example. So diffusion currents are comprised of the majority carriers on the end side, surmounting the energy barrier and then diffusing to the P side, and similarly holes diffuse to the end side. So there's a distribution of carriers of energies on each side, and a small number have enough to surmount. So it's usually these guys start first, and then it moves uh, up. And so I think I've misdirected you before. It's really going this direction. So as the, as the barrier is going up, uh, if this is the conduction band, it would be revealing these, and that leads to the exponential increase in the charge, because this is exponentially increasing um, from the Fermi Dirac. And the drift current, as we've been saying, is independent of the potential barrier. It's the small number of minority carriers that are generated in or near the depletion region, which diffuse to the depletion edge. This is what Aaron pointed out. Uh, uh, correct. Uh, uh, you know, ca caught the finer point. They are diffusing to the depletion edge, and then they're swept by the electric field through. So it is diffusion followed by drift. Small number of minority carriers are always generated by thermal excitation, whether it be in the depletion region, near the depletion, or outside, uh, way far away from the depletion region. But those guys don't count because they never get collected. They're a tree falling in the forest, but they are there. So the total current is the summation of drift and diffusion. So, uh, so as I've pointed out in class, this is technically incorrect because this is this is generation is is drift, but over here this is diffusion and drift. Drift never disappears. It just gets overpowered. It just gets overpowered precisely. Say that on the exam and you'll get a full points. So the potential barrier is then being modulated by the external bias. Right? So the depletion region is of high resistivity compared to the neutral region, and all are almost applied. Voltage drops across it, and this straightens out the band bending. And so you can go through the math, but we're not going to do that here. And let's skip past forward and reverse for now. And let's look at the band diagrams. I love looking at band diagrams. So we do expect to be looking at band diagrams. <coughs> drawing band diagrams. Actually, you're going to be drawing them. I'm not going to draw them. I'm going to be too lazy. Um, so here it's on the forward bias. And so therefore, you're revealing this, this carrier density. And so then all of a sudden, my diffusion is enhanced. Drift is unattenuated. Att uh, drift is driven by the temperature of the system, right? the ger thermal generation rate. So then that saturates. So then I have more of the holes coming across, more of the electrons coming across, and the drift is just unabated. It just continues. 
uh, as, as it did in the equilibrium case. And the reverse bias, although this, uh, as I pointed out, this, this uh, stacked bowling balls is wrong because their smearing out is, is determined by KT. So there's no reason why all of a sudden they would be distributed in energies. It's still going to be maintained the same as long as it's still room temperature. And so you can see that now this lobe has a much harder time circumnavigating. That's a much larger barrier. And so it's never going to get across. So now all of a sudden the diffusion plummets <laughs> to zero pretty much, and the, but the drift again continues unabated. And so the drift becomes a larger portion. And then there's the conundrum of the fact that how does it make sense that holes are coming from the P side and piling into the N side, and then they're annihilated by recombination? And I got electrons coming in from the N side, piling into the P side and getting annihilated by recombination. How do I have current discontinuity? It's like I send in the current and it disappears. Like my current, it's like a sinkhole, it's like a black hole of current. But then you have to think. It's the combination of holes going this way and electrons going this way, which is the same as cr current going that way, because the holes have plus one charge, the electrons have negative one charge, so you add these two together and you get constant current. So, so the, the universe does not implode. It's not a singularity. Right? It's current continuity. It's just passing the baton, the holes give it to the electrons, and the electrons continue. So. Once we have those carriers piling in, outside the depletion regions, we have an excess buildup, right? So we have this excess charge, and uh, that piles up, and so that is exceeding the equilibrium values of N sub P and P sub N. And so then we get into deviations of ideality which the newer version of Streetman does a better job at uh, reviewing. So you get, um, uh, let me jump past that. I'll come back to, wait, that's repeated. Huh? Uh, okay, never mind, let me, let me do that. So, so uh, okay. So this is the. I'm uh, sorry, I misread this. It's deviations. This is derivations. So the derivation can be the charge control model, which uh, or the slope of the minority carrier distributions. It's a little hard to read from sideways here. So the charge control model is predicated on the fact that this minority carrier charge. These are the holes that came into the, wait, these are the hole. no, this is the electrons that came in uh, from the N side to the P side. So these are the excess electrons. And these are the excess holes that came from the P side into the N side. And so if you count that up, uh, this, you can assume that that amount of charge has to be replaced every tau seconds. That's the charge control model. Q sub N, this, integrate under the curve, is replaced every tau n seconds. So statistically, I put a charge up in the conduction band, and it's going to stay there for a microsecond before it falls back down, right, statistically. So on average, it might be up there one microsecond, one tau, time constant tau. So we can assume that they're all going to re be replaced on the average of this tau time constant. Okay. So based upon that, you can actually, and a knowledge of the uh, wave function, the envelope function that determines what that excess uh, minority carrier charge is, you can actually uh, extract out what the current is. So current is just Q, uh, is, 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 is coulombs per second, right? Amps is just coulombs per second. So Q is coulombs, tau is seconds. So it's coulombs per second, or in other words, amps. So I just calculated the current in the charge control model. A little more finer point is you could similarly do it from the tangents of minority carriers. And you'll see that when you're doing the diode switching. Let's skip over that. So 
so we're assuming that an average lifetime of a hole in an n-type material is tau, that's the entire distribution recombined. So this is saying the same thing that we just saw in the graph. And we're using this identity here. And so then we end up with the diode equation. And then you see that the reverse saturation current, which is this whole uh, minus I naught term, is actually housed by parameters that we can either calculate or know from how we built the diode. We can figure out what the diffusivity is of holes, diffusivity of electrons, based on a knowledge of how much we doped it, which semiconductor we're using, right? Those are all calculated. Even the diffusion lengths, we can, we can estimate based on a knowledge of the material parameters. And we can calculate the minority carrier charge as well. So all these are, are, are being able to be calculated from first principles. And that becomes the reverse saturation current. The, this minus I naught. So, yeah, you can get into the, uh, the, 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 the tangents and so forth, but let's not worry about that as much. So then the minority carrier, major, majority carrier uh, current, so the drift occurs with the depletion region uh, and within a diffusion length of the depletion region. So drift is neglected out in the neutral regions, outside the depletion region. Okay. So the minority carriers are traveling across and recombine. The minority carrier current is taken up by the majority carrier, which must resupply electrons, because it's connected to the external circuit, to replace those lost by recombination. Um, so then, okay, let's skip that. So here we go through. And so here we have a little better representation of the charge. It's basically the same graph. It's a newer version. Um, uh, of Streetman. And here's the slope version. Okay, so we have our diode equation. We have a, a depletion region, PN junction, and we have those parameters. And then we see that again. Now let's think about switching dynamics. So here is forward bias, excess, and then we have the minority carrier extraction. We have a depression below the, the, um, the equilibrium value. Why do we have a depression below the equilibrium value? Well, I should ask that on the midterm, shouldn't I? Why is it depressed when I'm minority, when I'm uh, at reverse bias? Forward bias, reverse bias. Donna. No? Yes? The depletion region is growing. True, but it doesn't impact that. Why the minority care? Why is it depressed? Yeah. Why is it going down? Why is it not a PN? Why does it go down at, uh, at, at reverse bias? <coughs> well, i got to ask this on the midterm. No, I can't. Yes? Um, I can give a guess. Um, does this have something to do with the applied voltage outside? No. Uh, the, like, the carriers are swept across by... Uh, drift, but they aren't replaced by diffusion. Precisely. Bingo. He gets 100 points. <laughs> right? Drift and diffusion balance each other. At reverse bias, it's perturbed from the equilibrium condition. Diffusion is suppressed. Drift is unabated. That's what I was just saying before. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of uh, hammering you a bit, because I'm calling in the question, were you paying attention? Because the, the diffusion is depressed, and so therefore they're not one-to-one, -one, and so therefore the, the drift is extracting and sending charge over to the other side, and the diffusion is not pl playing ball anymore, and they never send a, a carrier back, right? Because the barrier is now so high. Okay. So... Uh, let me see. So... 
Then we get into some of these uh, breakdown mechanisms. We have Zener tunneling at low voltages due to, due to quantum mechanical tunneling, one of my uh, favorites, and avalanche breakdown at high voltages. And so, uh, so that's the manifestation, the reverse, uh, reverse, set, uh, reverse bias breakdown. And so reverse bias breakdown, one can be Zener, occurs at a few volts, or avalanche at much higher. So if you hear something below 5 volts, something below 2 volts on the exam, it's probably Zener. If it's in excess of 10 volts or 20 volts, it's probably avalanche. Uh, so Zener breakdown is going to assume that you have a highly doped junction. So with a highly doped jun junction, the um, and, and I have to reintroduce quantum tunneling because I don't know how well it was done in physics. If you have a barrier and a wave function coming in, in quantum mechanics we say it can tunnel through. There's a finite probability that a wave function can tunnel through. And it, or it can even tunnel into a state, quantum well state, and so forth. So tunneling distance, D, uh, uh, when D decreases uh, within uh, tunneling distance, D decreases with increasing reverse bias. And that's what's shown here. Under a modest bias, there's there's no opportunity for tunneling. Here, uh, for further reverse bias, I have this. Uh, it's now very narrow. If I actually put even more reverse bias, this will become even more bent and more more dramatic, and more thin, and. So which carriers are actually coming off here? These are actually the electrons in the valence band. So think about that. In the valence band, We have an ocean of electrons, and we might have a few missing places, and those are going to be our holes, right? They're like little air bubbles, right? But for all intents and purposes, the valence band is filled with those 4n electrons from the 2s, 2p states, right? So this is actually below the holes. This is just all the way down to the core level down here at 13.6 electron volts. This is going to be filled with electrons. So although we are always talking about the valence band having holes, just below the surface is all these electrons. So as this bends, I'm peeling off the top right underneath where the holes are. I'm peeling off those electrons. And there's almost like an infinite supply of them. So this can keep going unabated as long as you continue to bias it. So that's what I'm trying to show here. If you do kind of a crude, primitive uh, EK diagram, band, band structure, you see that the carriers are sort of piled up in the conduction band, and the holes are piled up in the valence band here. And this is primitive. You know, the carriers aren't really here. This is cartoon, by the way. They're really on the edges here. But it's kind of illustrated. This is filled up with electrons uh, up, to the, uh, up to the point where the holes are. Uh, so you're getting this on one side talking to this on the other side because of the way the bands have bent. Yes, Aaron. So for uh, tunneling, why, why do you need high doping? Ah, because that satisfies the third criteria. I need to have... I need to have available carriers, which are sitting right here. I have to have these empty conduction band states on the other side and, uh, to send them to, and I have to have a small distance in between. High doping means the depletion region is extremely narrow. So if you, unless you have a, 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 a... So tunnel junctions are always highly doped, at least the Saki tunnel junctions. But if it's doped, don't you have more... Like, aren't there more electrons and more holes? So aren't there really, like, the same amount of states? Uh, you know, above a certain point, there's, there, there's, there, there, it's empty. You will, have, you will have a lot of electrons over here, true. But once you get above that, 
And you see that manifestation when we get to tunnel diodes in the applications. Yeah. Um, okay, so avalanche breakdown is the concept that the carriers are zipping down with the uh, applied drift, applied electric field. So they're traversing the depletion region and they're getting accelerated. And if the kinetic energy they take up If this kinetic energy uh, exceeds uh, the, the band gap, so, uh, so that's one half m star uh, v, v squared, if, if that uh, exceeds the band gap voltage, then it can generate an electron hole pair. Right, so one carrier in produces another electron hole pair, so it's an avalanche multiplication event. So it has to exceed, it has to be accelerated to the point that it, uh, that it hits the um, band gap voltage. Okay. So obviously this is going to be band gap dependent. It's going to happen more quickly at a low band gap material and, and less at a wide band gap material. So yeah, here you see the carriers pop, pop, popping down. And uh, yeah, and here, here's another. Okay, so then the carriers are coming in and they're multiplying. Okay, so here you can see the band gap dependence. So as, as the as the as the doping is increasing, the depletion region is narrowing, and eventually quantum mechanical tunneling takes over. But at the more lightly doped, it's going to be avalanche, and that's going to be in, uh, referenced by doping and uh, band gap, and so. A wide band gap material that's lightly doped is going to be able to handle a thousand volts before it breaks down. Okay, special cases is, was the punch through, sort of uh, one of the depletion region extends to the contact, then that's a way of pulling charge out. So essentially, I don't know if it's drawn well there, but it's essentially. as if I'm truncating this and putting a boundary condition on the excess charge, that QP. And if the contact is there, then that puts a boundary condition. And now, all of a sudden, the charge has to come down and hit zero because the contact is taking it away. So I've now limited the amount of charge that can grow there because I have put a boundary condition by putting this ohmic contact nearby. This is a higher order effect phenomena, not one of the core concepts that I'll probably have time to challenge you on the midterm. Um, carrier switching dynamics, though, is important, and I've kind of beat this uh, dead horse uh, many times. You have junction capacitance, minority carrier storage time delays. Um, so. Basically, you have two uh, capacitors. You have the junction capacitance to the dipole and the depletion region, the, the ionized acceptors, the ionized donors. Then we have the charge storage capacitance, minority carriers that are outside the depletion region, but in the neutral regions. That's the second capacitor. So it's charge storage capacitance. So the junction capacitance is just dependent upon the depletion region. That's going to be varying, right? That's a function of voltage, right? Depletion region grows with the reverse bias, it shrinks with forward bias. So we end up with this depletion dependency. And so we're just adding the subtracting charge, these slabs, and we end up with a uh, capacitance that's varying by the, the, um, as the depletion region grows. Right? So as this varies. That's usually not as much of a rate limiting step. The rate limiting step tends to be more the um, in speed is going to be the uh, charge storage capacitance. This. So we go back to our QPs and QNs, and so if we rewrite that equation where I was QP over tau P, we rewrite it in this way. QP is basically the envelope function of this minority carrier. So it's Q times A, the delta PN, which would be here, and then a function of LP. 
and so then it's exponentially, and so the capacitance due to this change, dq, capacitance is, is dq dv, right? You go back to your physics, electricity, and magnetism. So now we have a formalism for what q is, so you can plug that in, and you see that the charge storage capacitance dominates for bias. And so it depends. If I had a If I had a uh, current where uh, forward was, uh, say, at uh, oh, say two volts, and this was the curve, and then I go to two times IF, maybe that's at three volts, I don't know, I'm just guessing, then I would have over-biased it, and I would have added this extra amount of charge here. And so if I'm adding more charge and I'm making this as a digital switch, I have to remove that charge to flip it down to the minority carry extraction. So this is the, the concept. I do not need to over-bias it and put two times IF. I want to, for digital switch, I want to simply have it go a little bit positive, a little bit negative. So uh, it's proportional to I. The larger the IF means more stored charge, and it's proportional to tau. So um, tau is like I have, it's the recombination here. So it's like I put a hole in my bucket and I'm leaking charge out, right? It's going to be leaking by ta the tau time constant. So, the, the, um, so if, if tau is shorter, I'm, I'm removing it more quickly, faster, and it's like I have a bigger hole in my bucket. So that's another way I can remove this uh, and, and, move it, and move it from forward to reverse faster. So you can see, I, for a fast diode, I either want IF to be modest or I want the time constant uh, to be uh, short. Um, so let's get past that. So then we end up with the concept of, yeah. So maybe the only equation you might have to commit to memory is this one, uh, where it's basically uh, uh, articulation of what is the minority carrier charge in this region as a function of t, dq dt, and it's simply how much charge am I putting on with the forward bias current, and how much charge am I taking off with the recombination? Those are the two terms. So you understand that, and you can answer the switching diode equation questions, right? Because that's all it is. Forward bias diffusion current and recombination that pulls it, brings it, restores it back to equilibrium. Because this guy going up wants to come back to equilibrium. This guy going down wants to come back to equilibrium. Generation recombination statistics will bring it back to here once I take, remove the external perturbation of a bias. Okay. So uh, the minority carrier uh, concentration, let me see, let's go to the diagram. Turn on transit, let's go to the diagram. Yeah, so for bias, uh, I'm running as a digital switch. I've got four bias, and I instantly switch it to zero. So I'm turning this off. But the diode doesn't do that. The diode is going to slowly respond, and the charge will slowly come out, and the profile of the edge is going to sag down like this, and the tangents are all going to be the same. Then, Is this linear or semi-log scale? This is, uh, this should be, I think it should be linear. I think it should be linear. So then it's following this. This is drawn a little more gently. And so this should be uh, constant current, constant current, constant current. And that's why you get this constant reverse current. And I'm probably going to ask some question related to this. <laughs> if I can telegraph this. Why do you get a large reverse current momentarily when you switch a diode from forward to reverse? Right? Why? 
Stored charge. The minority carries stored charge, which... Diffusion suddenly cuts out. No. Junction wants to get rid of all that extra charge, so it's going to kind of shunt it backwards. Which yeah, it's really kind of a Kirchhoff's current voltage law around the loop that the diode is momentarily full due to the capacitance. Remember, you cannot change the voltage across the capacitor instantaneously. That you should have learned in linear circuit theory. And so, therefore, the diode, a, a diode, a PN junction, has capacitance. So its voltage does not shift quickly. So it's It's stuck at this. It's trying to go from forward to reverse, forward to reverse. And this is a very modest, you know, I don't know, 1.2 volts. And this is maybe minus 10 volts or something. And so this is stuck in a very small, modest uh, bias across the junction. And until the minority carriers are extracted, it's going to maintain that it's got a small forward bias on the Kirchhoff's voltage law loop around the... Uh, uh. So therefore, if... if uh, this one's not drawn as well. This one's drawn better. But the forward bias, and the diode has, what, uh, 1.2 volts around this loop. So this is up 1.2 volts. Uh, well, I don't know. Well, let's say it's one, up 1.5. This is down 1.2, maybe I'm dropping 0.3 across this parasitic resistor. And then I flip to reverse, and I'm at minus 10. And this is still at 1.2 volts, right? So if this is minus 10, and this is 1.2, the only way I can satisfy this loop is by dropping 8.8 .8 volts across that resistor, which implies I have a huge amount of current going through there. Right? When I have a huge amount of current, it's right there. So the, di the capacitance of the diode pegs the voltage across the diode. And because the voltage is pegged, Kirchhoff's voltage law says I have to flow a, f uh, a large amount of current. So this is a manifestation of the diode physics, but it's actually Kirchhoff's voltage law that shows you this. So you have to le leverage your... So then the voltage across the diode stays high and it slowly comes down. And then once it gets here, then it can go very quickly into a reverse bias. And then it's going to nosedive, and it'll take on that reverse bias characteristic. So that's the tail wagging the dog. Uh, the modular series does a good job. You see t equals 0. And here's the point that it kisses. Here's the equilibrium, p naught 0. And so this point at where it's switching from forward to reverse is right at that point that this uh, minority carrier distribution kisses the PN naught. And so it's right there. Okay. Yeah, so this even shows it better. So that's the demarcation point where that large reverse current is now starts to become abated, and it's now going, and then it comes up to its reverse side. So this will eventually go to minus I naught. But this is the point. Until it gets to that switch, until it gets to here, it can't start to switch. Okay. Yeah, so you actually end up with these uh, freakish uh, spikes and so forth. So you put in digital switch to a diode, you actually don't get a digital switch out. You're going to get corrupted. So you almost have to like do a, uh, a, 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 an inversion, a Fourier transform inversion or so forth to, to predict what is my diode. We had to do this at Bell Labs when we were making uh, laser diodes, for instance. If you want to make a digital switch, the laser diode is actually going on non-linearly. So your input signal was actually not a digital waveform. It was an inverse Fourier transform of that. And uh, so you had to transpose it, and then you got a digital switch out. OK. 
right, so deviations from ideality, a lot of great testing questions from here. We've got we've got what's going on here? N equals two. And low bias, low forward bias. Why is why do we have n equals two? Generation and recombination. Generation recombination. So uh, the the diode has so. Uh, we have not gotten to the sweet spot. Only these guys are starting to come across. Only these guys are starting to come across. So the forward bias is actually doesn't really take off. There's really a delay, right? The cut-in voltage, V cut-in, that you learn about in circuits, right? There's a delay. And the delay is the fact that this lobe, the pr predominance of the carriers, is actually a certain voltage distance um, between that. And so that becomes essentially the cut-in voltage, you could say. It's proportional to it. And so until we get to where the dominance of the carriers are, that's when it starts to kick in. So when we're down here, we still have our drift guys going on, the, the, the generation, right? The little electrons up here, the holes down here. This is depressed, so therefore it has a... <coughs> N equals two flavor, because generation recombination is happening as a two-carrier event. So ideality factor is two, two-carrier event. Electron holes, gen generation, the ele electron jumps up, creating a hole. It's a two-carrier two event. So N equals two is, is, is representative of a two-carrier uh, uh, um, effect. Diffusion is one carrier coming across once this gets pulled up. So that's a single carrier event, so n equals 1. And here, at high level injection, that's the case that these are coming in at such large amounts that now electrons coming this way are finally hitting and colliding with holes coming this way because your current density has gotten to be so high. So they're now the, the, before the two armies were passing right past each other and didn't even know their existence. But now at high injection... Uh, they're passing, and this electron hits a hole, and they recombine. Again, two-carrier, two-particle event, so n equals 2. Then eventually, the, the Kirchhoff's voltage law means that the, the uh, resistances in the, in the bulk, resistances in the contacts, resistances in the wires gets very excessive, and, uh, and so ohmic effects bend it over. Worst case is that it actually burns. It turns into a and smoke. Why does this increase? Now this is semi-log. Why does this increase as we go in reverse bias? Depletion region is larger. Depletion region is linearly growing with bias, so this should be linearly increasing. This is a semi-log scale. And then we get into our breakdown. We already covered breakdown. So uh, yeah, deviations from ideality. You can see, for instance, the manifestation of this, this cut-in voltage. You can see how it's delayed depending upon band gap. So you can go through uh, germanium, silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide phosphide, right? They all scale, and it's dependent upon how far. And so as the band gap is getting larger, this, this potential is getting larger. So... Um, we're always having generation recombination, right? That's happening everywhere. It's happening in the depletion region, out, uh, near the depletion region, outside the depletion region. That's always happening. And so as the depletion region grows, that ends up exposing more. Uh, we pretty much covered all that. Special cases, not really that important. I can make linearly graded junctions. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't, let's not worry about that. Metal semiconductor junctions. Right? I have the four permutations. We, f we generally teach following the Anderson model that you take the work function of the metal, work function of the semiconductor, you marry it together, these points click, so that stays right where it was, right here, 
and then the bands bend accordingly to their degree of freedom. So in this particular case, remember the mantra, this is showing that the uh, electron energies are higher th in, the, in the semiconductor than they are in the metal. So therefore, I have to reduce the electron energies with respect to the metal. And it's n-type material, so how do I make n-type material less n-type? I deplete it. So I end up with a depletion region behind it. Right, so it depletes, and I create a Schottky diode. I can do the same thing with the holes. I put uh, the holes, a uh, p-type material is on semiconductor. This is electron poor. And so the only way I can make this more p-type, uh, I'm sorry, more n-type, this p-type material more n-type, is to deplete the holes. So again, I have a depletion region, but now this is a depletion region of holes. So that's harder to visualize because you have to stand on your head. But, um, but that's a depletion of holes, okay? And then the opposite two effect, here it is in bias, so you can modulate. And again, this stays the same. The barrier height is invariant to the applied bias, but I'm changing this barrier. So this is forward bias, this is reverse bias. And I still have the same carrier statistics in the, in the semiconductor. Uh, then I have these uh, special cases of the, uh, of the uh, omics. I'm going to blow this up just a little bit. Yeah. So here I have, this is electro, uh, the, this n-type material is electron poor with respect to the metal. So how do I make n-type material more n-type? I just grab all those electrons that are rattling around because there's lots of free electrons, right? So I pile up those free electrons as if it's like a semi-metal, and I get this dipole of, of, of electrons right at the skin depth of the semiconductor, and I have the holes here in the metal, and so these are piled up, and so I end up with really no significant barrier for electrons to go across, especially electrons coming from the semiconductor to the metal. There's no barrier. Okay. And the same goes for the holes. I want to make... I want to make the p-type material here more p-type, drop its, volt, uh, its, its energy level with respect to the metal. So the only way I can make p-type more p-type is to pull all the holes, and so then the bands bend accordingly. Right. So you just have to think of the degree of freedom. I need to make n-type more, uh, more, more electron-rich or, or electron-poor. And then what's going to happen? If it's electron poor, it's depletion. If it's electron rich, I'm accumulating free electrons. So, yeah, so then we get the two contacts. Practical real world. The reality is that we actually get interface states. And you saw that in today's lecture related to MOSFETs, right? Anytime we have a terminated semiconductor surface, we have dangling bonds, we have opportunities for, for it to, to grab carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, anything from the environment, sodium, and create interface states that are going to pin the Fermi level and, and, and perhaps make a Schottky barrier when there ideally should not be a Schottky barrier. Maybe this metal of choice and that semiconductor should have manifested as omic, but the Fermi, the uh, interface states made it uh, shocking. Heterojunctions is just a, an extrapolation where you're taking <coughs> two semiconductors, and here this is electron rich with respect to this. So this is n type, this is p type, and so therefore the bands bend and they link, and we have that discontinuity. We have a delta EC conduction band offset. And we have a valence band offset. And here, in this case, the conduction band offset, because this is a PN junction, the conduction band offset is, is enhanced. And we have a huge barrier. Uh, we've now skewed this, so we have a much larger, a disproportionate barrier for electrons to go this way, right? And a very modest barrier now in comparison for holes to go this way, right? Because this, fo this folded back on itself for the holes. And, um, yeah, and then we can make those interesting mod FETs. 
where you can have this discontinuity, and you see how this triangular quantum well is below the Fermi level. So this is a wash in electrons. This quantum well is below the Fermi level, so this is filled with electrons, creating that two-dimensional electron gas. So this becomes a FET into the board. My source here, my drain over here, and the gate here that I'm pulling this up and down. But that's mod FET. So we're just talking about heterojunction as the as the root source of making a two-dimensional electron gas for a mod FET. Um, okay, that's end of segment one. Diode applications, let's have a little more fun. We can make rectifiers. So if we want to make a rectifier, we want to minimize reverse saturation current. We want to make this full on current. This is voltage and full off. We want to make it a digital switch, right? A rectifier, short circuit in the forward, uh, open circuit in the, in the reverse. So we have to think about those deviations in the ideality and how to manage them. So I want to minimize reverse saturation current that made this sag. So perhaps I want to use a wide band gap material with a low intrinsic carrier concentration that lowers I naught. I want to reduce the power losses that cause this to bend down. So I'm going to increase the area of the device, so I reduce the ohmic losses. I'm going to highly dope the layer of the contact, so that the contact resistance, the metal semiconductor contact, is, is well behaved. I want a high breakdown voltage. I don't want this drooping. So I'm going to again use a wide band gap material for a high critical field. Use one-sided junction, so the lightly doped side governs the breakdown voltage. Right? It's just an extrapolation of everything. Switching diodes, we talked about that. Um, if you have the minority carrier charge, if I have a recombination center at mid-band gap, then electrons can fall down, holes can fall up, and I have increased their probability of meeting each other because I have this way that they can go back and forth across the conduction and valence band by having this trap level in the middle. So that means I've basically opened up a huge uh, hole in the bottom of this so I can extract the carriers very quickly. Uh, they use this as a photoconductive switch, actually. If you want to make a switch that's like a femtosecond, you actually do this, where you create uh, recombination centers. Uh, I can tell you more about that offline. Uh, make, a, make the lightly doped um, neutral region shorter than the minority carrier. That was the narrow base diode I referred to. Okay, breakdown voltage. Varactor, we saw the capacitance versus voltage change, so I can make a variable capacitor. Tunnel diodes, again, I'm only going to test you on... Um, a Saki tunnel diodes, which is this. So now I've degenerately doped. This question came up before. So here's my holes. It's degenerately doped. The Fermi level's in the valence band. And the uh, holes are here. So that means below that holes is electrons, remember? I have a rich, uh, it's a pea soup of electrons. And here is the, uh, here is the um, uh, carriers uh, of the electrons for the, uh, for the uh, end side. And so then these are coming across. Uh, so let's, let's go on the forward bias. So in zero, they're here. They're detuned. And as, the, uh, as, as this goes into forward bias, the, uh, these el electrons shoot into the uh, quantum mechanical tunnel into these whole states. And so I get a quantum mechanical tunneling. So I get I get a tunneling current. The keyhole effect. So this lines up with that, and here it's perfectly aligned. I think my battery's starting to go. This perfectly aligns, and I get the tunneling. And the tunneling, then the keyholes misalign, 
and the tunneling goes down. But I still have a normal diff uh, diffusion current. That is a normal diffusion current with the cut-in voltage, right? And then it takes off, right? And uh, in reverse, I have all these holes, but these electrons down here, Zener tunnel, and they Zener tunnel starting at, z at zero volts. So then this is tunneling this direction. So then the summation of this is my tunnel diode. The summation of those three current components. That is an Asaki tunnel diode. It's a tunneling, it's a diffusion, and a zener. So we get this interesting hump. As far as 3030 is concerned, this is as far as you have to take it. I've exposed you to some of the quantum tunneling that my group does, and the rest is eye candy, to be quite honest, for this class. Um, uh, yeah, so this is all just interesting. Okay, then we get to solar cells, right? We want to be green. We hope that we don't uh, uh, bake up the world. I hear. What was it, uh, Alabama or something? It's like in the worst drought they've ever been. Um, and so we need more solar cells. But that is operating in the fourth quadrant, right? So it's a, it's a diode that is just photo-enhanced, right? Because we have the normal diode. Let's go back to an ideal diode for a change a moment. And this is the reverse saturation current minus I naught, which is the generation uh, of carriers in or near the depletion region. But if I'm shining light on it, my generation rate goes up, right? So I put one watt on, I put uh, five watts on it. I put ten watts on it. I put a hundred, you know, uh, twenty watts, fifty watts, a hundred watts, and I'm going to get an open circuit voltage and a short circuit current. And this is going to be the root basis of my solar cell, where I'm going to have voltage maximum and current maximum. And that's going to be the maximum operating point for extracting power. Sorry, guys. And so it's just the, 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 the photons coming in are just artificially enhancing the generation rate. It just goes back to drift. Drift is the carriers generated in or near the depletion region. And now they're just artificially enhanced by pho photon absorption. Assuming H nu is greater than or equal to the band gap, right? So now I just have to select the right band gap to hit the right uh, uh, material. So here's the NREL efficiencies, all the different band gaps, the different semiconductors, the trade-offs, their costs, um, and so forth. I really want to ask you more things like this about the generation rate, how this is going to happen. I'm not going to be asked. This is state of the art. Again, this is just kind of I'm trying to give you take what, what the foundations you're learning and apply it to state of the state of the art current events so that you have an appreciation for these foundations and how they apply to the real world. Uh, the solar spectrum um, obviously is way beyond the visible of Roy G. Biv, so that's going to dictate what semiconductors you're going to use and may uh, send you on a quest to do all these different band gap engineering on different substrates where you're having to man uh, manage uh, misfit dislocations and things like that. And so here you can see the whole Roy G. Biff. Remember, uh, indium nitride is really here. Um, so I can hit all those colors. And I can hit into the ultraviolet, and I can hit into the infrared. Because right? so the solar spectrum clearly goes beyond visible into the infrared. And so the better solar cells collect in the infrared as well. Um, and so then there's an attenuation, right? Most light is absorbed at the surface. 
And as you go deeper and deeper, it, it rolls off at e to the minus alpha x. Alpha is the attenuation coefficient um, in inverse centimeters. So you always do a units analysis. So the exponential has to be unitless. So if it's alpha x, then alpha has to be in inverse centimeters, x in centimeters. And they cancel. Oh, here's the photo generation. So now, what is this? I guess this is a photodiode now. Magically, we're, we're in the third quadrant. So OK, so now we're operating this as a photodiode, uh, it looks like. Yeah, OK, so th here's the third quadrant. That's a solar cell. That's a photodiode. Oh, no, we're back to a solar cell. OK, so I don't know why that was in there. Um, so light's coming out, and we need to extract. What's, what dictates the distance between these grid lines? Generation in or near the depletion region within one diffusion length of the depletion region. It's a diffusion length, LN, LP. So if you know the material quality, it's doping, you should be able to know what the diffusion length is, and you're going to set the grid lines to be uh, a little bit less than the diffusion length. Because if your grid lines are farther than the diffusion length, then any carriers absorbed in the middle are never going to make it to the exit doors, right? So it's, you're in the middle of Dr. Strangelove, someone yells fire, you're not going to make it, right? It's too far, the exit door is too far away. Anybody see that yet? I didn't see it yet, don't give it away. I'll see that when I get back. Okay, so here's the, here's the grid lines um, and, uh, and the maximum power. Okay. And then they try to confuse you by inverting it, doing a mirror image, but this is really this. Don't be confused. That's just a mirror image. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, photovoltaics people came from the 1960s. Um, so here's the before and after. We have all these carrier dynamics that can happen. And um, you can put together a equivalent circuit model. You basically have at the heart of a, a diode, you have a uh, dependent current source, right? And then you have some parasitic resistances. And if you want to get fancy, you put some parasitic capacitances on there. But it's basically a dependent current source. Uh, and so then you can have space applications, which might be a triple junction uh, solar cell, or uh, terrestrial applications, which would be single crystal silicon. Uh, different band gaps uh, to extract different swaths of the solar spectrum. This is a diode, so you usually have parasitic resistances and, and shunt resistances. And so in this particular case, uh, this diode degraded, the solar cell degraded over time, maybe it was sitting up on the, on the sun and the Arizona sun was baked and the ohmic contacts got worse and it got more and more resistive and all of a sudden that solar cell that was, that those solar panels you put on your roof in Arizona that was cr producing a kilowatt of power, now all of a sudden produces 200 watts. And then you realize that you, you bought these from some overseas vendor and they were made of poor quality. And what probably happened is there was diffusion and all these things that happened that the whole PN junction shifted over time because of the thermal energy. Okay, if you want to get fancy, you can te texture it and do light engineering. That's just making sure that every photon in rattles around and doesn't escape un uh, un unabsorbed. Um, so here's, uh, this is lesser used. Here's the triple junction that might be used for space applications where you're, you've got, uh, uh, yeah, so here's the tunnel junction. So this would be the, uh, the one in the gallium indium phosphide band gap. This would be the gallium arsenide uh, uh, band gap. And this would be the, uh, wait, it's a little confusing in this diagram. Gallium arsenide. Uh, yeah, so I guess it's gallium and new phosphide of a certain percentage, gallium arsenide, and 
Oh, that's that's just a um, buffer layer. It looks like it's two gallium arsenides. So that's a little confusing. I'm not quite sure. This might be a, a double junction. Okay. So photo detectors. Okay. So now we're operating here. Now we want every photon in to be collected, and we want it to be collected quickly. This is a lossy device. We're going to run this at maybe 20, minus 20 volts. Maybe we're going to run it in the avalanche regime where it's maybe a minus 100 volts. So we want every photon in to create an electron hole pair that we can measure. And we want it to do so quickly at the picosecond level. So we are simply carriers coming in. Uh, H nu is greater than band gap. And we're absorbing. We want to create a large drift region. We do not want carriers absorbed in the contacts. We want all the carriers to be absorbed in the I region. So we, so we stretch this PN junction, make it a PIN. We make this large one micron, two micron thick I region in the middle where we have a constant electric field. Carriers are absorbed in or near the depletion region. In this particular case, we want them to be in. Because diffusion, as Aaron pointed out, is diffusion is happening at the periphery. That is a slow, statistically random process. I don't want that mapped onto my fiber optic system. That's going to slow things down. I want to run in the drift mode only, so I only want to corral the absorption to happen in the, uh, in the depletion region. So uh, know, know this. Why does the absorption coefficient? Uh, this is quantum efficiency, but it could also be absorption coefficient. So why does the quantum efficiency of photodiode uh, go up and come back down? What's, why, is, why is it attenuated on the right-hand side? At larger, uh, longer wavelengths, which is smaller energies. Yes? They don't have enough energy to knock the electrons up into the collection band? Yeah. H nu goes below eight A G. You know, I've never caught in your name in all this time. Garrett. Garrett, okay. So this is this is uh, so it's below the band gap. So it's the it's the band gap, uh, it's acting as a band gap filter. Right. Why is it uh, uh, attenuating at the uh, larger uh, energies, uh, smaller frequency, smaller smaller wavelengths? Do have to do with ohmic loss? Or... No. No, yes. Near to the surface. Near to the surface. So the absorption coefficient is getting higher. We want, ideally, you want uniform illumination. Ideally, we want uh, carriers. I guess I better not go to the right side of the screen. Ideally, we want carriers absorbed throughout this drift region. But as the, uh, uh, as the carriers are getting higher and higher in energy, they're absorbed immediately. So this moves towards here, and, and then you're starting to, to, to absorb near this interface. Not all the carriers can get across because they're too close to the surface. There's surface recombination effects, and, and maybe they're even being absorbed in the contact, and so the surface is playing a role. So it's exactly right. It's, it's becoming surface contact uh, dominated. Uh, you can even see, by the way, on the absorption coefficient, the difference between direct band gap and indirect band gap. Because the direct band gaps tend to have a very sharp demarcation point, and silicon here has that phonon-mediated absorption, and so you see it has a soft edge because it's got that shoulder due to the phonon-mediated. But that was midterm one material. Um, so here's PIN. Here's the fast. If you want to do separate, uh, separate absorption and multiplication, you can run it in the avalanche mode. And uh, carrier multiplication takes place where the carriers are now accelerating. And now the carriers might be coming by the large electric field, because you're probably operating this minus 100 volts. Uh, the carriers are launching off these steps. and. Uh, if, they exceed, if the kinetic energy exceeds the band gap voltage, then they can create secondary and tertiary and so forth on uh, uh, multiplication. Oh. 
Metal semiconductor photodiodes, this is a finer key po point. I just want you to understand that uh, when you have Schottky diodes, this is a majority carrier only device. So all those minority carrier storage issues are gone. So this can be very fast. So these type of diodes have been clocked up uh, to, um, uh, to uh, ter uh, terahertz. Terahertz frequencies with this kind. Um, Yeah, that's eye candy. Okay. Um, I don't know how much I'm going to get into fiber optics and stuff like that. I think that's a because uh, that's less semiconductors. I want you to understand how the semiconductors fit in the equation, though. Um, so then you get luminescence. You can get photoluminescence, cathode luminescence, electroluminescence. We love electroluminescence because that means we're using a p-n junction to create light. And that's what an LED is. We want to make all those colors. We want to emit. And so we're, we're going through these LEDs. And here we're making PN junctions in the forward bias. So we're operating up here. And if it's a direct band gap material, we would hope that the uh, creation of the electron hole pairs would emit light. And we get an LED. Am I skipping over too much? Uh, yeah, you basically the carriers are the, the photons are emitted in two pi stradians. They're all over the place, and then you put it in the package, and you can do it in in organics too, right? That's the fun of my Samsung phone. Uh, this was eye candy, pun intended, uh, just to show you how LEDs work in the human nature and everything. Um, so let's skip past that. Um, laser diodes is just basically we're now putting a fabric perot. We're just putting two mirrors so that the light emitted has this ricochet, uh, this, this, this etalon, and so therefore the light, where's the laser diode? Yeah, so then we have two mirrors, we have a boundary condition. So then as one photon is created, it bounces back and forth, and eventually it's going to go past an ionized center and, and, and an electron that's up in an excited state, and it'll stimulate that to release, and now two photons. And so it creates, it creates a standing pulse wave that bounces back. That's basically what a maser is. Microwave laser. Is, maser was, the first, was invented first uh, at University of Michigan, by the way. Uh, and uh, laser was invented uh, later using the same principle of, of a cavity and the boundary conditions. And so then you have the, the uh, longitudinal modes of the fabric peroetalon mapped onto the emission spectrum of the LED. And so now your LED magically becomes a laser because you have a boundary condition uh, on it. And so then these are your lasing modes. And... Yeah, and so eventually it's going to be stimulated emission, a, a spontaneous emission. Then the, uh, the modes will start to appear as you pump it a little bit harder, and then eventually it's going to go into lasing. And, yeah, so you can make all these fancy lasers. You can do modal control and uh, generate. And, yeah, you can now do quantum mechanics where I can... Um, put make the high, high, improve the probability for the electrons that are going to uh, corral here to recombine with the holes that are going to be found here. And then on top of it, I can make modal engineering where I can determine the mode of the light, how narrow the light is focused. <laughs> I don't know if you learned this in your electricity and mag magnetism. The harder you focus light, it's just going to unfocus on the other side. Right? If you focus light down very sharply, then it's going to... If you sh uh, sh uh, focus light down for the vectors, then it's just going to pass through the other side and, 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 and flare out. So then it's very hard to hit an optical fiber with a little core. So you actually want to come in more sharply. 
right? So this is modal control. Ben. Remember one time in physics they showed us a picture that light was going through a hole that was tiny, and then on the back wall, a certain distance away, it was a big ring again. Yeah, yeah. So here we're trying to do modal control because the, the more we squeeze the light, the more it's going to uh, be, be far field is going to be more diffuse. So this is a modal control. The one is for the quantum mechanics and the other is for the light. And then you can see what are the allowed states. You're just talking to the conduction valence band and the quantum mechanical states. And you can do distributed free back lasers. Maybe that's a little higher order where you can do frequency selective. And then we're done. Hey, it's exactly 7 o'clock, according to that clock. Well, 8 o'clock, no one changed it. So that's 90 minutes on the spot. Your pizza's getting cold. Any questions? You'll be here on Wednesday, right? I'll be here on Wednesday. Yes. What do I have? And then you'll pack that day. Yeah, I gotta pack that day and I gotta go uh, pick up something from the doctor before I go. But I'll be around. You can you'll see me in class. Is the midterm going to be like a good mix of both PDFs, or is it just going to be? Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, more yeah. heavy on the PN side. Maybe more heavy. Yeah. Okay. Not so much on the application side. A little hard to say. Okay. Yeah. Let's record.